suggest that maybe in the next 100 years or so, people's life expectancy might get up to 100. Well, that's the crazy thing. Some demographers have found that if you take the country each decade since the mid-1800s that has the highest life expectancy, it's gone up in a linear fashion for the last 150 years. So there's no slowing down of increased life expectancy. We could easily be at 100 uh, years life expectancy within 50, 60 years. Wow. Uh, what about... Um crime, we talked a little bit about that, war. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got a chapter, what about crime and war, freedom and faith? Uh, frankly, it's pretty hard to think of good news these days with what's happening in our world vis-a-vis -vis Libya, Syria, uh, you know, the, um, the, the conflicts that are resulting in the famine in mm -hmm. uh, Somalia. Uh, do we have more or less war right now? Well, that question gets at the heart of this book, and that is, what's our basis of comparison? Yeah. Undoubtedly, we have too much war. Undoubtedly, we have too much famine. I mean, I, I was really struck by the clips you had earlier about what's happening in Somalia and Kenya. And that's our comparison. We compare it against what we want, and so we're always amazed at, or in despair that we don't have it. But if we compare it to the past, we can realize that things are getting better. So, a nice measure of war is battle deaths. The number of battle deaths since World War II each decade has steadily dropped. We have fewer people dying in the world because of battle than we used to, even though the world population is going up. Do we have too many battle deaths? Absolutely. Is it getting better? Yes. And so there's a tension there. We want to be encouraged by the progress, but encouraged to do even better as opposed to complacency. Now, I would think that some preachers aren't too happy to uh, read your book or hear you speak because uh, uh, y you can do a lot of sermonizing on uh, the world going to hell in a handbasket, you know, and uh, you need to come to faith now. You get it, Jim. Um, that's absolutely right. And sometimes I wonder if Christians actually hear more bad news than non-Christians because bad news is so useful in the pulpit. So if you want to do a sermon about some topic and get people to change, which a lot of sermons you know, have that uh, logic to them, a good way of doing it is by scaring people or upsetting people or talking about how bad the world is for five minutes and then give 20 minutes a solution. But because of that, we hear so much bad news. I, I've actually had to a couple times, Jim, in my um, going to church, cover my 10-year-old son's ears because of the graphic description of despair coming from the front. What's your 10-year-old think of that? I do wacky things, so he's, he's pretty used to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, you, do, you, you write this, uh, some pretty funny things, too. I, I, I love your sense of humor. I also like the fact that in your book you, uh, you highlight Christians who are making a difference in the world and you, you really have a, a great overview of, of all of that. We've got about five minutes left. The big topic of discussion out there is the environment. You, yeah. you, you ask anybody on the street, is the environment better off or worse off than it used to be? Everybody says worse off. You don't necessarily agree. Not at all. It's a mixed bag with a lot of positive. So let's take air quality. Air quality has improved throughout North America. In the United States, the number of days that they have to shut down school PEs uh, in Los Angeles has dropped. Air quality in New York, Chicago has increased. So th things are getting better. We used to spew mercury and lead in the air. Government regulation stopped that. So air quality is better. Water quality is better. The streams and rivers are, are cleaner. You mentioned a river in, in Cleveland. In Cleveland that caught fire. <laughs> In the 1970s, there's a river that actually caught fire. A river caught fire. Now, I, I mean, I'm reading this, I'm thinking, come on, you're, you're kidding me. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I think water's not supposed to catch fire. No, no, I, you don't have to be a scientist. <laughs> uh, you don't have to be in school to know that. But now, you can catch fish in it. You can do, you know, there's trout and salmon or whatever else uh, swim in that river, and it's much cleaner. Um, the big issue, of course, is global warming. Yeah. But even there, we have to acknowledge that the world is getting warmer. People disagree quite a bit as to why, and I'll, I'll stay out of that, I don't yeah. know. Um, but my point there is that the fear is in the future, what could happen, not what's already happened. And so really, if we just look at what ha what's happened in the last 40 years, there's a lot of pluses with the environment. And is this because we became aware of environmental uh, degra de degradation and we became proactive? Exactly. This is not the first generation to realize the world has problems. 2011 isn't the year that we, we woke up. No, we've been waking up continuously throughout human history and solving our problems. And so to say that the environment hasn't gotten better today is to say that all the work in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s had no difference. But if we say that, why do we think that the work we do today has a difference. Yeah. Uh, you're not exactly a fan of Greenpeace. 
<laughs> well, they're an easy target. I, bless them in the work they do, but they, they, they go overboard sometimes with the hyperbole. Yeah. Uh, you, you have uh, kind of a cynical hat on at times when you talk about how so many NGOs, they make their money out of tragedy. And uh, they don't want things to improve because if things improve, their money goes down. Yeah. A scientist found out that there's actually 100,000 fewer infant deaths worldwide than we thought before because of some statistical techniques. Um, so he recalculated it. People weren't happy. People were upset because they thought, oh, that'll make it harder to raise money and awareness. So you have that tension between bad news is useful, but too much of it is harmful. So what I call for is sort of an accurate understanding of the world. There are some bad things, get things getting worse. Let's focus on those. There are things getting better. Let's be encouraged by those. All bad news may mean that nothing is bad news. It may actually become just white noise. Mm. You know, the, the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. And, and there's an irony for Christians in that we hear so much bad news and we believe it, and yet we're doing so much to make the world better. So take the ministries here at Huntley Street. Think of all the good you've done, and yet we don't appreciate that fully. Yeah. The book is called Upside, Surprising Good News About the State of Our World. Bradley R. E. Wright, Ph.D., is the author. It's published by Bethany House, and it is a fascinating overview, friends, of a lot that's going well in our world. Of course, the best news of all is the good news of the gospel. Uh, gospel means good news, and uh, that's what this program is all about. And that's why we have uh, phone numbers that go across the bottom of the screen. They're there to uh, connect you with people who know how to listen and know how to pray. And if uh, you need some good news in your life today, why not make a call and uh, let one of our fine uh, prayer partners listen and pray with you and introduce you to uh, the best news that ever could be heard. We're gonna be back right after this. <laughs> 